years back, we had a woman from Thailand who came to practice meditation at the monastery. And she let everyone know that she was going to be practicing restraint of the senses. And then one day she came and complained to me. Apparently people down at the, the kitchen were talking while she was meditating. And she was saying, don't they know I'm practicing restraint of the senses? And I had to point out to her that restraint of the senses was her business. It was all about not reacting to what you hear, to what you see, in an unskillful way. You can't go out and make the world a perfect place and then practice. You have to practice in an imperfect world. You have to deal with difficult people. People who have ill will, people who have all sorts of unskillful intentions. And you can't hope simply that because you have good intentions that will magically prepare the way for you, smooth things out in the world. I was in correspondence recently with a monk over in Europe. And he's involved in setting up a monastery, and there's some controversy about the monastery. And he was saying, well, he felt that his good intentions should take care of everything. And I had to remind him, no, the Buddha never said that good intentions are enough. Your intentions have to be skillful. And you can't expect that just because you have good intentions, everybody will honor those good intentions and things will come out okay. You have to be careful about what you do. Remember the teachings to Rahula. You start out with good intentions, but then you have to test them. You have to act on them. And if you see well, you actually did cause trouble, then you've learned something. You've moved from just simply good intentions to more skillful intentions. And there are other instructions to Rahula as well. There's another time when the Buddha was asked by Rahula how to do breath meditation. And before he said a word about breath meditation, he gave a long series of contemplations to do first. And the first was basically instructions in patience and endurance. He said, make your mind like earth. People throw disgusting things on the earth, but the earth doesn't shrink away. Make your mind like water. People use water to wash disgusting things away, and the water doesn't get disgusted. Make your mind like fire. Fire burns garbage, but it doesn't get disgusted by the garbage. Make your mind like wind. Wind blows disgusting things around, but the wind itself doesn't care. And this is a preliminary to breath meditation. Now it's interesting, he's not simply saying just be passive. Because the instructions of breath meditation are very proactive. You try to breathe in certain ways. You try to breathe in a way that gives rise to a rapture and breathe in a way that gives rise to pleasure. He doesn't say how. You have to figure that out for yourself. And John Lee gives some, some advice on thinking about the breath energies in the body, allowing the pleasure and the rapture to spread. But it's all very proactive. It's something you're doing. You need the mind to be like earth, though, in order to see clearly what you're doing, the results you're getting. And also to put up with difficult things outside you. As the passage of the Buddha says, that there are four qualities by which you help other people, and, and in doing so you help yourself. And one of them is patience. You have to learn how to be patient with other people. That's a gift to them. But it's also a gift to yourself. Because if you find yourself getting worked up over things, that's the end of your restraint of the senses. It destroys your concentration. And you create lots of needless difficulties. What this means is you have to be content with your surroundings. And remind yourself, this is good enough to practice. Otherwise you get what they call a vipassana mind where every little thing becomes a major disturbance. Years back I was talking to someone who worked at a meditation retreat center back east. 
and I asked him if there was a difference between the people on their metta retreats and the people on the vipassana retreats. He said, yes, two things. One is the people on the metta retreats use a lot more honey when they fix tea for themselves. And the other was that the notes left on the bulletin board tend to be a lot nicer. And I saw you were looked a little sad today, so I wanted you to know someone was spreading goodwill in your direction, that kind of note. Whereas in the Vipassana retreats, notes are, who is wearing that loud jacket? Don't they understand that other people are trying to be mindful? Well, being mindful doesn't mean you have to have silence all around you. It doesn't mean you have to be surrounded by perfect people. Because after all, mindfulness means remembering. Remembering what to do in situations where the mind is relatively tame, and what to do in situations where the mind is getting upset. In other words, the practice is not for just perfect places. We don't have to run away to retreats to do it. The practice is for an imperfect world, because where else are you going to practice? And the Buddha didn't, say, the Buddha didn't say, once you make up your mind to practice, everything will go smoothly. There are going to be people who don't like it. I mean, there are people in the time of the Buddha whose families didn't want them to practice. Stories of young men and young women who, whose parents stood in the way. And so they had to go through lots of obstacles in order to practice. But they saw that the practice was important, because they didn't want their minds to be subject to the conditions around them. They wanted to train their minds to be independent. And the first thing you've got, first quality in this independence is patience, endurance. It doesn't mean you just grit your teeth and put up with the hardships. The trick to endurance is that you don't focus on the things that are difficult. You focus on the areas where you have a source of strength, you have a source of sustenance inside that you can draw on. So this is one of the reasons why we develop concentration, to have a sense of well-being inside. It provides our food that allows us to be patient with things outside. That means you can't wait for everything to be quiet and everything to be neat and everybody to do everything you want them to do, and then you're going to develop concentration. You have to develop concentration in the midst of an area of a life where there is noise outside, where people are not perfect. And don't equate perfection with what you want. So when there's noise, let, let it go through you. And John Cha says the problem isn't that the noise is disturbing us, we're disturbing the noise. We have to make a comment on it. We can't just let it be. I found a useful perception is that when there's a lot of noise, it's like wind going through a screen. Trying to make your sense of the body, make your sense of the mind in the present moment, like the screen on a window. And the wind blows through. the screen doesn't catch the breeze, and as a result, the screen isn't disturbed by the wind. It's when you put up a resistance, that's when you get blown around. So the nature of sound is to be loud, and then it stops. But our problem is that the mind doesn't stop. It reverberates, like a gong. And so you have to learn how to be matter-of-fact. The sound comes, it stops, you don't have to keep commenting on it. Even when the sound is there, it doesn't destroy your breath. Your breath is still there. You just focus on that. Remind yourself, if you're going to get through difficult situations, you need something to feed on, and the breath gives you free food. You learn how to breathe in a way that feels refreshing, feels nourishing, energizing when you need energy, relaxing when you need, need to be relaxed, soothing when you're feeling wounded. This practice is meant to be done in a world that's not perfect. That just doesn't mean that we don't try to adjust things and improve things when it's possible, but there comes a point where 
you can fix the world up so much, so much, so much that you don't have any time to practice. And John Fuang used to say that we, we have both the, what he called the internal what and the external what. The word what in Thai can mean both monastery, and it can also mean your schedule for the day, your practice for the day. He says it's your internal what, the, the one that's your practice, that's the one you have to maintain. That gets top priority. The external one should get secondary priority. And when you go out in the world, the world tends to be very insistent. They insist that they get top priority. But you can remind yourself by developing patience, by developing goodwill, a mind of sympathy and harmlessness. You're being good for the world, and, and that comes back to you. It's good for your mind to be patient, to have goodwill. It's not that just the people outside are benefiting from that. You're benefiting as well. So these are qualities that you can create from within, and they're an important part of the practice. All too often people come to the practice, they learn a little bit about mindfulness, they learn a little bit about the Four Noble Truths, and then just plunge right in. They don't have a foundation. everything gets skewed. Start with the basics. And one of the basics is make your mind like earth. Make that the foundation for your practice and it'll be solidly based. <laughs>